specifically human brain development, is that it occurs mostly under the impact of the environment and mostly after birth. Now, if you compare us to a horse, uh, which can run on the first day of life, we see that we are very undeveloped. We can't develop, we can't uh, muster that much neurological coordination, balance, muscle strength, visual acuity until a year and a half, two years. And that's because the brain development that in the horse happens in the safety of the womb in a human being has to happen after birth. And that has to do with simple evolutionary logic as the head gets larger, which is what makes us into human beings. The burgeoning of the forebrain is what creates the human species, actually. Um, at the same time, we walk on two legs, so our pelvis narrows to accommodate that. So now we have a narrower pelvis, a larger head. Bingo, we have to be born prematurely. And that means that the brain development that in other animals occurs in utero, in us, occurs after birth. And much of that under the impact of the environment. And um, the concept of neural Darwinism simply means that the circuits that get the appropriate input from the environment will develop optimally, and the ones that don't will either not develop optimally or perhaps not at all. If you take a child with perfectly good eyes at birth and you put him in a dark room for five years, he'll be blind thereafter for the rest of his life because the circuits of vision require light waves for their development. And without that, even the rudimentary circuits present and active at birth will atrophy and die, and new ones will not develop. There's a significant way in which early experiences shape adult behavior, and even and especially early experiences for which there's no recall memory. It turns out that there are two kinds of memory. There is explicit memory, which is recall. This is when you can call back facts, details, episodes, circumstances. But the structure in the brain, which is called the hippocampus, which encodes recall memory, it doesn't even begin to develop fully until a year and a half, and it's not fully developed until much later, which is why hardly anybody has any recall memory prior to 18 months. But there's another kind of memory, which is called implicit memory, which is in fact an emotional memory where the emotional impact and the interpretation that the child makes of those emotional experiences is ingrained in the brain in the form of nerve circuits ready to fire without specific recall. So I'll give you a clear example. People who are adopted have a lifelong sense of rejection very often. They can't recall the adoption. They can't recall the separation of the birth mother because there's nothing there to recall with. But the emotional memory of separation and rejection is deeply embedded in their brains. Hence, they're much more likely to experience a sense of rejection and a great emotional upset when they perceive themselves as being rejected than other people. That's not unique to people who are adopted, but it's particularly strong in them because of this function of implicit memory. People who are addicted, given that they, according to all the research literature, certainly in my experience, the hardcore addicts all, uh, virtually were all uh, significantly abused as children or suffered severe emotional loss, their emotional or implicit memories are those of a world that's not safe and not, not helpful, caregivers who are not to be trusted, and relationships that are not uh, safe enough to open up to vulnerably, and hence their responses tend to be to keep themselves separate from really intimate relationships, uh, not to trust caregivers, doctors and other people who are trying to help them, and generally see the world is an unsafe place. And that's strictly a function of implicit memory, which sometimes has to do with incidents they don't even recall. Infants were born...